going to tell you about a specific case that we've been dealing with in terms of some illegally salvaged wreck material. In this case, I'm focusing on three particular historic bronze guns, but the, the actual presentation is going to cover a significant um, number of guns. Um, the image on the screen does vaguely relate to the case. Um, this is the return of Charles II, um, and the, one of the wrecks that we're going to be talking about today um, was one of the vessels that were sent to escort him back to the UK. So, um, I'm very aware that there'll probably be people in the audience who aren't familiar with the role of the receiver of wreck, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about who and what we are, first of all. So, I'm receiver of wreck for the whole of the UK. I'm appointed by the Secretary of State for Transport, and I sit within the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. So, there is just one receiver for the whole of the UK, um, and I have one deputy. And we cover all wreck material recovered within UK territorial waters and all wreck material brought into UK territorial waters. So it's quite a tall order for, for two people to deal with. So our main statutory functions are covered by the Merchant Shipping Act 1995. Um, that's part nine of the Act. And almost all of part nine relates to the receiver of wreck and explains what the receiver should do, what the obligations and statutory functions are, and also what wreck finders and wreck owners are required to do. So onto that piece of legislation, it can be distilled into three main sections. So the receiver of REC is required to reunite REC owners with their property. So REC owners have a statutory one year period to come forward and provide proof of ownership to any recovered REC material. Um, we also ensure the payment of a fair salvage award. So similar to the Treasure Act on land, uh, salvers who have provided a beneficial service to a rec owner are entitled to a salvage award. And that salvage award can't exceed the value of the material recovered. We also dispose of unclaimed rec on behalf of the Crown. So if at the end of that statutory one year period, no owner has come forward, then anything from inside of UK territorial waters will automatically become property of the Crown. And we will then dispose of it on behalf of the Crown. And to the letter of the law, that is through sale and auction, but actually we recognise that that's not always appropriate for the material that we deal with. So we're always looking for the most appropriate outcome. So I work within the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. We are not a heritage body. So we deal with um, maritime heritage management effectively by default because of the wide ranging nature of the legislation that we deal with. Um, I also administer Section 2 of the Protection of Wrecks Act, so that's wrecks which are deemed to be dangerous by virtue of their contents. And I also administer the Royal Prerogative for Fishes Royal, so I have to remove um, stranded whales, dolphins, porpoises and sturgeon throughout the UK, except in Scotland. So it's a weird and diverse role, but we're focusing on the Merchant Shipping Act today. <laughs> So section 236 of the Act is the main section that relates to anyone finding or taking possession of wreck. So it states that anyone finding or taking possession of wreck must report it to the receiver. And they also have to describe the marks by which it may be recognised. And the idea is that that description should help an owner to recognise their property. And these days we generally ask for photographs because that's just the easiest way to do that. We don't ask finders to actually send us things. We're based in an office in Southampton. We don't have anywhere to put it. Um, that said, because of the case that I'm going to be telling you about, we do have quite a significant collection of wreck material at the moment, but generally finders will hold on to that material and they are expected to take all reasonable care of it during that one year period while we're looking for the wreck owner. So failing to report wreck to the receiver is a criminal offence. It's punishable by a fine of up to £2,500 per offence, so that could be per item recovered. Um, you also lose your right to a salvage award and you have to pay the owner or person entitled to that property double its value. So depending on what you've recovered and failed to report, that could be incredibly expensive. So this is a summary offence, there's no custodial sentence attached to this. So in order to enforce this, the receiver of REC has a number of statutory powers. Um, up until 1995, the receiver actually had the power to bear arms and to kill, maim or hurt anybody <laughs> obstructing the receiver's duties. Unfortunately, that disappeared in 1995 and I've been working in the receiver of REC team since 2000, so I missed out on that entirely. Um, we do still have some um, quite considerable powers under the Act. So we have the power to search and seize with a search warrant. Uh, we have the right of way across private land, we can uh, demand the immediate handover of wreck material, and we can still use force if necessary in some circumstances. Um, we can also grant that power to others, for example police officers, customs officers, who can then carry out those duties on our behalf. Um, in the years that I've been working in the receiver of wreck team, we've used almost all of those powers. Um, one of them I didn't mention, I also have the power to commandeer a vehicle. <laughs> I, I've never yet done that, but I'm looking forward to the day. Um, 
Prior to 2011, there had been no prosecutions under the 1995 version of the Merchant Shipping Act. And there are a number of reasons for this. So uh, there may be many people in the room today who've never heard of the receiver of REC and never heard of the requirement to report REC to the receiver. So it's not necessarily well understood outside of diving and salvage communities. Also, the offences that we're dealing with take place offshore, underwater, added to which finders have 28 days to report their recoveries once they've recovered them. So we're trying to identify and prove offences that have taken place potentially outside of territorial waters, 100 metres deep in water, and then a month later at the very least. So it's a really challenging thing to try and come up with the evidence related to that. So just when I'm talking about wreck material, I am talking about, if you imagine wreck as a collective noun, so I'm not talking about just one individual or entire wreck, so it could be anything from a vessel, aircraft or hovercraft. So we deal with aircraft that have crashed at sea as well. Um, that covers the vessel itself, its fixtures and fittings, anything that was in the cargo, any personal possessions, so anything that was on board that vessel um, or separated from that vessel. It doesn't cover human remains, although they can still be subject to salvage, they're not wreck. So we deal with everything found on the shore, under the sea, washed ashore from tidal waters. So we also deal with rivers as far as their tidal. So it's quite all encompassing. Um, also, it's regardless of age, size or value. So we deal with wreck material pretty much from the Bronze Age all the way through to modern lost shipping containers, uh, cabin cruisers, etc. So it's a huge range of material. So the case I want to tell you about today uh, starts back in 2007 um, when a salver, a recreational diver as far as we were aware at the time, reported the recovery of two historic bronze guns. Um, this is an unusual thing for us. Finding guns on the seabed is not particularly unusual, but bronze guns are quite unusual to be found. So there are lots of cannon sites out there that divers visit regularly, but they're usually iron guns. So having found two bronze guns was quite an unusual thing. Um, he identified the wreck site as being in the Thames estuary and didn't initially tell us exactly what the location was. And um, you can see the two guns here, so the one at the top there, the Peter Gill gun, um, which was made between 1588 and 1595. Um, Peter Gill is known to have been um, a gun founder for the Board of Ordnance, um, but as far as we're aware this is the only remaining example of his work. Uh, this one down here is called the Commonwealth Gun um, because it had the crest of the Commonwealth on it. Again, it's the only known bronze gun with a Commonwealth crest. Um, that was made in 15, uh, sorry, 1653 by um, George Brown, uh, again specifically for the Board of Ordnance. And this one down here is just a zooming in of the Tudor Rosen crown from the Peter Gill gun. <clears throat> So our job then, once this has been reported to us, is to carry out some research and try and determine who the legal owner is. So obviously we are also going to take into account its historic value and we're going to be looking at what its historical and archaeological context was, but our main focus is determining who the legal owner is. So we carried out some research and we were able to show that these guns uh, had come from the wreck of the warship London, which blew up and sank in the Thames estuary in 1665. Um, we were able to show that through canon experts who determined that these guns were specifically made for the warship London um, and there was documentary evidence in the National Archive to show that. Um, we could also further prove it because obviously both of these gun founders had made a number of guns for the Board of Ordnance but these ones had been bored up from uh, 18 pounders to 24 pounders to complement the warship London particularly. Now I should also say that that actual research took over a year, so it wasn't until after the end of the statutory one year period that we were absolutely able to say that these guns had come from the warship London. So the MOD would otherwise have been the owner and they were familiar with this case all the way through but were not able to claim ownership. Um, that said, they are actually in the Royal Armouries at the moment and will probably stay there. So having said that those two guns were unusual, some months later the same salver then reported three more bronze guns. Um, apparently from an unidentified wreck site outside of UK territorial waters with no other wreckage around, just an isolated find. Now this kind of got us suspicious to start with because two was unusual, suddenly another three a few months later, very unusual. Um, also I said before that the Crown makes a claim to all wreck inside of UK territorial waters, so finders who are aiming to benefit financially from their finds may perceive some benefit to them in telling us that the finds are from outside of territorial waters because then they'll get to keep it if we can't find the owner. Um, also telling us that it was from an unidentified wreck site with no other wreckage around it on the seabed basically makes it incredibly difficult for us to determine what wreck it's come from and therefore who the owner might be. 
So these guns particularly, as you can see from the images here, uh, we were able to identify them as Dutch guns. They have the crest of the city of Amsterdam and the three of them were dated 1600, 1616 and 1617. So we did have something to go on. So these images here were the ones that were provided by the finder in support of his salvage claim. And it was nothing unusual at the time when we received the images, but if you note, they're quite tight angles. So you can see a little bit of sea in the background, but the gun is the main focus of the image and you can't see any seascape around it. So because we were aware that these guns were from uh, of Dutch origin, we contacted the Dutch authorities immediately uh, to give them some uh, opportunity to make a claim, which they did. They immediately claimed ownership to them. However, them being of Dutch origin and actually being um, legal property of the Dutch government at time of loss or when they were recovered isn't quite the same thing. So then the Dutch authorities would have to go through their own internal research to try and identify whether they can actually prove ownership. So we also contacted a number of canon experts um, in the UK for them to give us their idea on exactly what these guns were and where they might have come from. Um, they were able to do that uh, and we had uh, canon experts in the Netherlands and the UK look at these. Also, subsequent to the initial recovery of uh, the guns from the warship London, Historic England then protected the wreck site um, and there was archaeological work ongoing on the site at the time. And we discovered that Historic England, or English Heritage at the work at the time, Wessex Archaeology, who were carrying out work on behalf of Historic England, uh, the Royal Armouries, who were looking after the guns, and a number of other people kept referring to the five guns from the warship London. And we kept correcting them, saying, no, no, two are from the warship London, the other three are from an unidentified site outside of territorial waters. And after I'd corrected this three or four times, I wanted to know what the origin of this was. So I rang the Royal Armouries and said, well, why is everyone calling them guns from the warship London? To discover that all of the canon experts who looked at them were all convinced that all three of those Dutch guns had also been recovered from the warship London. And this was based partly on the patination on the guns, partly on the way they'd been eroded, the way that the sediment had settled around them. They matched very well with the same patination on the two guns that were known to have come from the warship London. So therefore, we then wanted to know, well, can we verify this? Is there any way that we can prove that these guns did come from the warship London? Uh, the finder maintained, no, no, they're from outside of territorial waters, they're from a sandbank northeast of North Foreland. So we took marine growth samples and we took sediment samples and we had those assessed to see if we could determine whether these particular guns had been sitting in the Thames estuary or in the North Sea. Unfortunately, both of those uh, lots of analysis were inconclusive. Um, also, we looked at the presence of tompions. You can just see the little bits of um, wood that have fallen out of the end of that gun. Uh, all of the guns had evidence of tompions, which basically means that they weren't in battle at the time the vessel was lost. They still had the, the plugs in place. Uh, so we knew we were looking for a shipwreck that hadn't been in battle at the time that it was lost. Um, we also went back to the um, cannon experts to see if we could determine exactly what was on board the warship London when it blew up and sank. And the Board of Ordnance have excellent records. They were very good um, record keepers and auditors of everything they had in their possession. Unfortunately, the warship London blew up and sank immediately before it was due to have an audit, so we don't know exactly what was on board at the time. Also, the in general terms, the records relate to the size of the gun. So in this case, we're looking for 24 pounders. Um, there were at least 19 24 pounders in the armories available to the Board of Ordnance at the time. So being able to prove not only that these were three of those, but that they'd come from the warship London was a challenge. And as I've said, throughout all of this, the Salva maintained that they were from outside of territorial waters. So at the end of the statutory one year period, in actual fact, at the end of two years, we held this case open for significantly longer than we, were, we really should have because we were convinced that there was something going on. Um, we were unable to confirm that all of these Dutch guns had also come from the warship London. Uh, the Dutch authorities were unable to prove their ownership claim, so they withdrew that claim. Uh, we couldn't find any evidence to firmly link these guns to the London. Um, the guns were apparently from outside of territorial waters, so the Crown didn't make a claim over them. And then in 2010, legal title was then passed to the Salvers, who subsequently then sold all three guns at auction um, for around about £56,000. Um, and the guns then left the UK, they've gone to America where they sit now in a private collection. So the following year, 2011, the same Salva then reported another <laughs> bronze gun. Again, from outside of UK territorial waters, no other wreckage around it, an unidentified wreck. And 
obviously, immediately, we were suspicious. We were suspicious the first time, and then when he did it again, it was like, there has got to be something going on here. So we tried again to see if we could determine where this gun had come from. This one is actually a beautiful gun. Um, the crest on it is from the city of Zurichsee in the Netherlands, and it was dated 1552, had the name of the gun founder on it, so we knew exactly where the gun had been originally, but how did it end up on the seabed off the Kent coast? We asked a number of cannon experts again to come and have a look at the gun. However, the key piece of evidence was somebody who came up to me at a conference who told me that he knew for sure that the Dutch guns had all come from the warship London and that he believed this one had also come from the warship London. Um, in the meantime, as I said, English Heritage had protected the wreck site. Uh, also, the Marine Management Organisation um, licensing regime had come into force, which meant that any recoveries of this size would have needed a license ahead of the recovery. So this then looked like there was potentially at least three lots of offences that had taken place. So we were then able to forward that on to Historic England, to Essex Police, to the Marine Management Organisation and to our own enforcement unit. Uh, this then led to a search warrant. Um, as I said before, the receiver of REC has the power to apply for a search warrant, however, our powers are actually very limited. So we can get a search warrant, but only to recover REC material. And we've heard from the, re the previous um, presentation that actually the documentary evidence and the images that go along with that are what are really important in terms of trying to bring forward a prosecution to actually prove what happened. So this was actually a search warrant that was got, um, uh, applied for by <coughs> Essex Police. Um, a Section 8 search warrant, which basically means they can seize anything they like, anything that relates to the crime or potentially relates to the crime, and that includes cameras, computers, GPS devices, phones, um, so anything like that was seized from the premises of the person who had reported the guns and also from the person who owned the vessel that had been used to recover them. So during the, sea, the search and seize we found a variety of other wreck material, um, from ship's bells to Elizabethan tin ingots to portholes, all sorts of things. Um, we had some 16th century candlesticks that were in the flower arrangement in his back garden. Um, and the, the Elizabethan tin ingots, um, probably we've, we've estimated their value to be between 30 and 40,000 pounds. That's just the intrinsic value of the tin. Um, in this picture down here, you can see that's one of the guns being taken away by the police during the search and seize operation, and that's one of the bells being taken away. Actually, we, uh, this was filmed by the BBC as well, and the uh, police got an awful lot of stick for what apparently appeared to be dragging the bell down the street, but actually, this bell had been turned into a coffee table and it had casters underneath. <laughs> but he did, he did love the bell. Uh, so, subsequent to the search warrant, um, the defendant was charged with fraud, because we couldn't charge him with failing to report wreck to the receiver, he had reported it, we just believed he'd reported it fraudulently. So he was charged with one count of fraud and 61 counts of failing to report wreck to the receiver. So then what we had to do was try and prove our case. So we looked at the images that had been taken from the computers and the phones that had been seized, um, and you can clearly see South End in the background. So the Warship <laughs> London is just off the end of South End Pier. So now you can see why they were such tight images that the finder provided. He, obviously, he didn't want us to see what was in the background. So we then also had to use military intelligence because we needed to show exactly the location where these images were taken. So the military were able to tell us exactly where they thought these pictures were taken, on top of which we then went to the Port of London Authority. And when you zoom in onto some of the things in the background, again, you can clearly see South End Beach. Um, also, you can see that little yellow navigation buoy um, in the background. We initially thought that might be Sea Reach 4. So we went to the Port of London Authority, showed them the pictures and said, which buoy is this? And they were able to confirm for us that's actually the outer South End outflow buoy. So again, that's nicely put us right off South End. This is what the military, or part of what the military were able to provide for us. So having given them all of the images, they were able to use the metadata in the images themselves, plus all sorts of other things, which I don't quite understand, to give us an exact location, time and date for where each of those images were taken. And as you can see, the actual images were taken from a second vessel. So obviously there was another vessel circling, taking images while the, uh, the cannons were being recovered from the water. And again, these all cluster very nicely around what you can see is the historic wrecks. So, having presented all of this information <coughs> to the salver, he then obviously had to make his own defence. <clears throat> he maintained that all three of the Amsterdam guns had come from outside of territorial waters. However, he did admit 
that they had then towed them from the site outside of territorial waters, dropped them on the warship London, and then come back and recovered them later. <laughs> so he said that they'd done this by rib, so each of those guns weighed about two and a half tonnes, so they could only have towed one at a time. We also had a rib specialist who calculated that it, the tow would have taken about 14 hours in each case, and they would have to have had a second rib to carry the fuel for the first rib. So it seemed incredibly unlikely. And in our own minds, we knew this was incredibly unlikely, but that's different to actually being able to prove it in a course of law. So there we go. That's the location from which the finder said he recovered the guns. That's the location where we believe he recovered the guns. And this is the tow that he said he did three times for each gun. So that's approximately 45 miles with a rib towing two and a half tonnes of bronze gun. So we were absolutely happy in our mind that did not happen. Added to which, if you were going to drop the guns anywhere, you wouldn't choose the wreck of the warship London. So this is average visibility. So these are the t uh, images of the two English guns that he recovered from the warship London. You can see there's not an awful lot of visibility there. It's also a very soft seabed, so the chances are that heavy guns would sink into the seabed. Uh, this one down here in the corner, that's actually an image from... Um, the archaeological work that was funded by Historic England and again you can see how incredibly poor the visibility is on that wreck site. Added to which, that's approximately where the wreck site is. That's the main shipping channel into all of the London ports, so the wreck site actually sits right on the edge of the shipping channel. This sh shipping channel has also recently been dredged deeper to allow for the largest size of container ships going into the um, London Gateway port, so you can see that's the kind of container ships going backwards and forwards on a daily basis. So if you were going to choose somewhere to drop guns to come back and collect them later, you absolutely would not do that. <laughs> so um, during this time, and unconnected to our case, we discovered that an American researcher had actually been carrying out his own research into the warship London. Um, he was a historian and an author and had seen reports of the original two guns from the warship London and therefore gone into the archives to do some of his own research. We, the MCA, also commissioned research um, to go into the National Archive, to go through all of the Board of Ordnance reports, to see how far we could take the um, documentary evidence of exactly what was on board London at the time. We were able to show that it was, uh, there was a mixed nationality of guns on board and that it did include 24 pounders. And this is where the two English guns, having been bored up from 18 pounders to 24 pounders to match the foreign guns on board, kind of comes into play as well. But this still wasn't proof that these specific guns were on board the warship London. So that is when we turned to our Dutch colleagues to see if they could help us in tracing the history of these guns from their original places on the walls of the city of Amsterdam to the seabed in the Thames estuary. So I will hand over to my colleague to come and tell us a bit about what she did. Yeah, so this wish list, as you call it, was actually a considerable list of questions. It was which I uh, I'm going to skip this for a moment. So these are the research questions in short. So basically, uh, what um, you wanted to know was uh, how many of these guns were there originally, and where were they now? Where did they all go? So you can imagine it's you know, a little bit of a problematic question because this is actually data that goes back three and a half centuries. And I, I said to you then, well, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to actually answer these questions. So I was quite conservative on that front. And this is actually the, um, the document that the writer, um, the American writer based his research on, which is uh, in the archive of the Grand Pensionary, which is sort of a prime minister at the time of the Netherlands, which was a republic then, as was England actually at the time. And you can see here all the 24 pound uh, Dutch guns of, uh, there were 32 of them. They went on board uh, these ships and um, had three of these, the yellow ones on the left, those were actually captured by the English. So this is according to our Grand Pensionary's uh, archives. But still, what happened to all the other ones? So here it lists 32. Were these all of them, actually? Uh, we didn't know at the time. So 
Um, first, we had to establish what we're actually looking at here. This is the, the, the Anglo-Dutch wars, as they're called here. In, in, in the Netherlands, they're just called the Anglo wars, actually. Okay. <laughs> we leave out the Dutch part. And uh, what you're looking at is exactly these sorts of situations. This is an actual painting from one of the battles. So um, it's a pretty chaotic situation there. Uh, in the first uh, Anglo-Dutch war, the Dutch, uh, they didn't have a real navy. We had to hire ships uh, to wage our wars for them, and we had to mm -hmm. hire guns. So they took the guns from the city of Amsterdam and placed them on board vessels uh, which were hired for this particular war. Uh, we were much better organized during the second war, which we actually won, by the way. <laughs> Don't you forget that. We raided uh, Prince Charles II, uh, King Charles II's uh, uh, fleet and took his, uh, the, uh, the big ship, uh, his, uh, what was it? Don't remember the name of it. Anyway, um, so we ha first we, we, we established a timeline um, just to have a, an idea of what we're looking at. So they, they, the, the, Navy, the, the government rented, um, hired 150 ships and placed the guns on board, um, which was actually before the war, so it was sort of brewing already. And at the same time, the city of Amsterdam took stock of what they actually had in, in, in the gun department. Uh, during the same um, in July of the same year, England declared war, and uh, in that same month, there was a storm near Shetland where several of these ships carrying these guns on board uh, were lost. As well, there were several battles which were of importance to this investigation. Um, one of what, which was in the um, in the Battle of Portland, which took over three days and was in the Channel, and there was one. Um, which was um, in the middle of the North Sea. I actually skipped that part here at the start. So this is actually where the suspect said that he found uh, these guns. If you compare that to a, um, a similar skilled um, map where, where the, uh, the battles, the sea battles took place, it could very well have been one of those battles. So at this point, we're not sure what we're looking at here. Um, anyway, so it could be possible that one of these ships was lost in the battle and there were actually guns uh, on the North Sea floor. So we turned to the, uh, the, Am the Amsterdam City Archives, which is the logical place to be looking for any evidence in this case. And we found uh, lists like these. So this is from uh, 1652. They actually took stock. They in inventoried all the guns they had available, most of, most of which were in storage and not actually on the bulwarks anymore <coughs> because, uh, well, we, we didn't have a need. There was, was no threat on land. So most of them were in storage. And um, these were not just the 24-pound uh, guns. There were 12, 18, uh, lighter ones, all sorts. So pretty long lists. And in all, we could discover there were 36 guns of 24 pounds at the time. So these are the guns that we want to trace, where they all went. And um, four of those were still on the bulwarks, and they stayed there during the war. Um, 32 of them, they, those were the ones that were placed on board of ships. Now, they were quite meticulous in uh, keeping all their, uh, their records here. So there were endless <laughs> lists of... Um, guns here, and what we actually discovered is that uh, most of these guns had a unique weight, which is extremely convenient in uh, an investigation like this. We didn't know this up front, we didn't know exactly what we would be looking for. Is it the crest or the maker or the year it was made? We, didn't, we weren't sure up front what they would use to document these guns. But it turned out they used the weight, and uh, this is in pounds, it's Amsterdam pounds at the time or the Hague pounds for the oldest gun. It doesn't matter, it's roughly the same as uh, your pound is now. Um, by means of exception, um, one of the guns actually turned up twice. So there was one um, which was listed double. And that was, I, that was probably the, uh, the 1616 gun. 
And the other one is the one that was made in 1600, the, the weight on the left. The, the gun that was made in 1670, we didn't know the weight because it had too much growth on it and it wasn't documented. And by the time we asked for what is the weight, it was already uh, in a private collector's uh, collection in the US. So we couldn't check it anymore. And I think you tried to put the FBI on it, but never got a reply for that. They did pay him a visit. Oh, they did. They did pay me a visit, but it wasn't cleared yet. Anyway, so we had to do with just the two weights of the two guns out of the tree. So further on, they made an endless note of where these guns all went uh, and um, which ship they were on, and then con continue to keep records of it, what happened to the ship as well. And they moved these guns around a little bit. So it turns up here on the ship that's called uh, the Crown Imperial. You can't read that, but. And the, uh, eight, the, the other gun, or the both of the other guns actually, they turned up on a ship called the Gideon. And lucky for us that this double, the one that was listed double, they went on board the same ship, so it didn't matter really which one it was. And it turned out that they moved around a bit. Um, the, the heaviest guns, I mean, because they had all the different weights, the heaviest guns went on the heaviest ships, and the lighter ones on the lighter ships. I mean, this isn't... It doesn't say that anywhere, but you could see. And I'm, I started my uh, of my career as a maritime engineer, so I know a little bit about weight. And you want, you know, you want your ship to be in balance. So they also they took the guns that had similar weights to put them on either sides, which is logical. And they always come in pairs. So what you see here, this particular record, it lists all the guns lost. So what we got on the left, top left, is twelve guns of 24 pounds that were lost in the war and they also said where they were lost so the top one it says they were lost on the crown imperial and that isn't actually true probably they were because they were replaced uh, or they were put positions on another ship which is listed below which also lost but the crown imperial sank and the the other ship which is listed below is called the great love that was actually taken by the English. So we think they moved those guns to the other ship. But in Amsterdam, they didn't know which guns were on which ship exactly. So even though they tried to keep meticulous records, they didn't always up to date. The other one, it says on the ship, the Gideon isn't right either, because the Gideon turned out in Amsterdam, while another ship, uh, the St. Matthew, was taken. and somewhere else i think this record it actually states that they replaced the guns on the gideons with lighter ones and put some heavier guns on the synth matthew so with, this is a lot of puzzling and i think crystal said the same thing this was also a lot of puzzling and in the end we'd be able to trace all of them and even went a bit further and found letters from the captains where they state how their ship was taken so this is a particular dramatic letter from the captain of the Great Love, who describes in detail how his ship was entered by the British. There was one ship on the side and one in the aft, and he had to give his ship up. And he was, you could see, you could re read by, uh, tell by the way he written this letter that it was sort of a traumatic experience. And he actually died in an English prison after a few months. So that was a, a, not a good ending for him, although, this particular ship, the Great Love, is the only ship that the Dutch recaptured in the second uh, Anglo-Dutch war, so there's a little bit of justice in there. <laughs> uh, in the end, we could retrace all the guns. We didn't expect that we could, but it turned out that we could actually tell where all of them went, um, where they went, on which ship they went, what happened to the <coughs> ship. So. All of these records, they were so well kept that you could, after three and a half hundred years, you could still tell what happened to them. So in short, four of these uh, 24 pound guns, they sunk with the Neptune near the Shetland Islands. Uh, two of them were, uh, they sunk with the Crown Imperial in the channel somewhere, but no idea where exactly, but it was in the channel during the, uh, the three day Battle of Portland. Um, six of them were actually seized by English and probably 
were all placed on board uh, the London. So three of those have now turned up. Um, the other three, we know what wage they should have, so they might still be aboard the wreck. Don't know. It's possible. And the other two, they returned to the uh, the storage actually in Amsterdam. So they turned up their weights and those particular guns. They turned up after the Anglo-Dutch war. <coughs> so in short, we could tell where all of them went, and nowhere near the position where uh, these uh, he claimed the suspect claimed there would be that there are no guns in the North Sea of this type. So that basically concludes this part of the investigation. <coughs> oh, oh. Just Sorry. to sum up. <laughs> Just to sum up. So, having done all of our research and been able to show using the weights of the guns and the size of the guns, we were able to determine exactly what had happened to them. So using records from the 1650s and 1660s, we could show a clear link or chain of evidence, if you like, from 1653 all the way through to 2007 when the guns were actually recovered that was good enough to present to the judge um, and to convince the defendant to change his plea to guilty um, in the face of all of the evidence against him. In actual fact, the judge said he was very disappointed that the guilty plea had been entered because he was looking forward to hearing the case. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was because I didn't have to testify. <laughs> so he subsequently um, was sentenced to two years in prison, um, costs of £35,000 rewarded against him, and another £50,000 proceeds of crime act uh, fine against him. Um, so he is actually in prison at the moment. Um, and it actually got quite a lot of media coverage as well. Um, although that's our first prosecution for fraud of this kind, um, it's been incredibly challenging, it's been very, very long term, but actually we now have a number of others that we're looking at. Now we've seen the process that we've been through, we obviously can't replicate this in every single case, um, but actually this is something that going forward we're likely to be looking at doing more and more. And that's the end of our story. Thank you.